special welcome to you. A special welcome to anybody who's come, especially anyone from another church tonight, and particularly if you've come for the first time uh, to one of our lectures. This is obviously the last of them for this year, but we're already planning next year, so we'll be pleased to hear. Um, for reasons that will become obvious in the course of the evening, I'm going to do um, announcements and notices at the beginning rather than at the end. So, um, first of all, not just for, for tonight, but for, for the whole series, for those who have um, helped in organising, and particularly in setting up the room, and in um, doing the, the um, recording, and also all those who volunteered to be in the kitchen. Very grateful to everyone who's done that. And of course, uh, to the other lecturers. I can't speak for the seedlings, obviously, but we know what a high standard the others have been. Um, as you leave, if you didn't see on the way in, there are going to be various things on the table out there. Um, uh, particularly if you haven't um, received a Holy Week handout saying what's going on uh, for the rest of this week, Good Friday and Easter, it's a, it's a green A5 sheet, so please take that. Uh, could I just mention that, um, obviously not for you, unless you're really enthusiastic, but um, for, for anyone you know who wasn't able to come this evening, I'm going to be repeating this tomorrow morning at 11.30. Um, and also tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock, we're having a Holy Week reflection and um, night prayer or conflict. And at that reflection, I'm going to be reflecting on the themes that have come through um, the lectures in, in the course of this Lent. So, again, if you're really enthusiastic, that's available at 8 o'clock in the church. I've also been asked to say that one of the other events uh, which is happening this week, which is the Morning Thursday Supper, is a bring and share supper, and if you're thinking of coming, there's a sign-up sheet on the table there um, for you to sign up on and saying, I think, roughly what you're going to be bringing. Uh, you can share everything, but it has to be brought first, obviously. <laughs> um, and then, finally, on the table outside, there, there is the basket. And um, since I think we've covered all our expenses, we're going to be giving any donations to the appeal that, just around the corner, a local Christian charity has recently made, for which we as a parish will be having a gift day after Easter. So... Tonight, everything is closing in. Talked in the past, introducing the speakers about how the week seems to, the week of Jesus' ministry seems to have become more intimate, particularly in the last three weeks. And here we are, only Jesus and the disciples, his closest friends. Uh, and not only are the numbers of people drawing in, but so is what's happening. Darkness has fallen. Everything is becoming a little more tense. And in fact, I would say a lot more tense. And if you remember how we finished last week, it's that single verse, single line. After the Last Supper, when they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And we were asked a question about the hymn. Well, what I can guarantee is that the hymn was not this one. But we're going to sing it tonight as an introduction to my talk. Uh, please stay seated. And we're just singing these two verses. 
it is to be standing on holy ground. Various different perspectives on Gethsemane and what happened in the garden. And finally, we're going to see if we can make sense of what Jesus was praying and how it might be that we could appropriate some of that in our own prayers. First of all, Julian's going to read the Bible passage. And Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up and let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Thank you. So we hear in that first part of the passage about Jesus prophesying what's going to happen. Not everything that's going to happen, but particularly in relation to the disciples. And he says, first of all, you're all going to become deserters. You're all going to leave me. And Peter, as was quite typical of him, said, well, all the rest might, but I won't. And... Um, Jesus said to him, Peter, you're going to betray me three times. In other words, you're going to exceed the others. You're going to exceed them in the wrong way. And Peter was desperate to make it clear that that was the last thing he was going to do. But we know that it wasn't. And again, all of them said the same. All of them were convinced at that point, just a few hours before they were going to do precisely what they said they wouldn't, that they were going to stay stick by Jesus. And so it's only a few verses on, beyond this passage, as, the, as Judas and the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, that all of them deserted him and fled. And then, of course, Peter and asked whether he was one of those with Jesus, one of them, whether he was a Galilean, cursed and swore, I don't know the man, and the cock 
crowd. It's worth just reflecting on what this desertion meant then, what it all means nowadays in a way. I think most of us know what it's like to let someone else down. This can happen in general terms, only today we heard about uh, the fire uh, officers in Manchester saying that they had let the people of Manchester down at the suicide bombing last year for structural, not for individual reasons. And the report makes, makes it clear how desperate the firefighters themselves were to get to the fire, well not to the fire, but to the, um, the explosion site and their protocols that didn't allow them to do that. So we might be aware of that kind of shame of having let other people down in a more general sense in that way. But perhaps we all know only too well the shame of having let other people down personally. <clears throat> so the disciples were going to understand what that was like. They didn't already know, as I'm sure they probably did. But having been so vehement that they weren't going to let Jesus down, that's precisely what they did. And they must have been ashamed. And Peter particularly, with his triple, not just running away, but absolutely denying that he knew Jesus three times. Peter needed a lot of persuasion, I think that he could be restored after the resurrection. And even in this passage, Jesus gives some sense that restoration may be a possibility, because in verse 28, he says, I'll go before you to Galilee, which are almost exactly the same words that the angel said to the women at the tomb. Go and tell the disciples that Jesus is risen and that he will go before them to Galilee. The idea of going before reminds us of a shepherd in a, in a moment. Or, or actually in that passage we've already heard that uh, prophecy of Zechariah about the shepherd being, being struck and the sheep scattering. And then we have Judas. Those of you who were here the week before last may remember that I asked Vishpa Buckingham, Alan Wilson, whether there was any way in which it would be possible to redeem Judas in some way. And um, this seemed, I, I was surprised that it seemed to him a slightly strange idea, and probably to most people it's a strange idea. The man who in history betrayed the saviour of the world, and Jesus himself saying, better that he had not been born. And then in Matthew's account, we hear how Judas hanged himself. Or in Luke's account, we hear how he bought a field and, as he was taking possession of it, fell down dead. I don't know how we reconcile those two accounts of Judas's future. And I wonder whether either of them is right. What would have happened immediately was that Judas was no longer one of the twelve. The other disciples, in the middle of their own shame, would have nothing to do with the man who was responsible for betrayal or handing over. And so Judas's life, maybe by his own actions, had been torn apart at that point. He couldn't go to other people who might have been friendly. The priests looked down their noses at him. So what is it that Jesus was saying? Better not to have been born. And I think it is just in extreme ways that sense of shame of having let other people down, having let the disciples down, but of course primarily having let Jesus down, when Judas realised that his actions were going to lead to something perhaps quite different from what he expected. And so in all these cases, in different ways, we have shame. And actually... Perhaps 
No one knew what happened to Judas because he crept away to live for the rest of his life, however that long that was, with that terrible shame on his conscience. Well, there we have people who are deserted, people who figured largely in the account of Jesus' ministry. But there were others, weren't there? The women who were faithful to the last. We hear about them standing at a distance on Calvary. We hear of them, or some of them at least, going to the tomb on the first Easter morning. These women were faithful at the last and at the new beginning. And it's wonderful to see, at least in that place, that the women disciples are given their full honour. It was they who were at the tomb first. And no one, not even a man writing a gospel, could take that away from them. And so not everyone deserted Jesus. Not everyone did. I wanted to talk about them standing on holy ground because as we approach Gethsemane now, that's what I think we're going to be doing. And I also hope that I might be able to pop in an Ethiopian picture for you, and I couldn't find one of Gethsemane. So here we have Moses and the burning bush from Ethiopia. You can see God in his special house in the middle of the flames. And Moses standing up there. And you'll remember what God said to Moses. As soon as Moses saw the burning bush, God said to him, Take off your sandals, because the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So I'm not going to ask all of you to do it, but I think it'll be symbolically adequate if I do it. And um, I want to emphasise through the rest of what I'm going to say, that we are somewhere really important. There's a danger, isn't there, that when we get to Good Friday, we'll think of all the horror and everything that went on on that day as the only place where Jesus suffered. But I'm quite certain that he didn't only suffer there, and that at Gethsemane, there was a foretaste, as I'll describe, of what was going to happen. The other thing I thought I'd do is that I feel that as we approach this holy ground, uh, I shouldn't be distinguished from everyone else. I don't think there's any call for that. And um, so with these modest changes to um, what I'm wearing, we can now proceed. <laughs> We're going to take various looks at Gethsemane from various different points of view. And you can see four different ways of um, thinking about Gethsemane. So the first of these is what I rather grandly call salvation history, although that's the way that the earliest Christian writers, when they came to think about what was going on in the garden, uh, looked at it. And in fact, even before the first Christian uh, writers, the, the, the Christian fathers who kind of commented on the uh, gospel histories. Um, Paul was writing to the Corinthians just a few years after Jesus' death and resurrection. He wrote this, since death came through a human being, by which he means Adam, the resurrection of the dead has come through a human being, that is Jesus. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made, made alive in Christ. And so it didn't take long for for people to reflect on the fact that death came to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Death came through rebellion and disobedience, through sin. And all of that was kind of cleansed by what happened in this other garden, this Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus demonstrated his absolute obedience, even unto death to his Father, God, and there, thereby gave the opportunity for all the forgiveness, both before and after, to be wiped absolutely clean, and for us 
and for all Christians to be put right with God. There are quite a few Old Testament accounts which involve the Mount of Olives, not Gethsemane specifically, but Gethsemane is on the Mount of Olives. And I thought we'd just have a very quick look at these. Particularly the account of David. David, as you know, was, um, had a slightly dysfunctional family. And when his son Absalom became very popular, raised up an army against his father, David was in Jerusalem and he decided that he needed to flee rather than the city be taken and something happening to him. And so he took the Ark of the Covenant with him and went out as far as the Mount of Olives, which overlooks Jerusalem, but um, is further away than uh, we might think from these accounts. And he was on the Mount of Olives and clearly he had thought through what was happening and he decided that he shouldn't take the Ark of the Covenant with him. He sent it back to Jerusalem, Absalom, to capture if that was what was going to happen. And he and those people who were with him continued on their journey. Verse 30 of 2 Samuel 15, David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered, and he was barefoot. All the people with him covered their heads too, and were weeping as they went up. So the Mount of Olives has a history of strong emotions, worry and fear and uncertainty as to what the future will hold. But it also has other interesting aspects. Solomon, who started off so well, took some wrong turnings and he set up idols to foreign gods on the Mount of Olives. And God's anger was kindled against him. Idolatry, the worst thing that the Jewish people could do and the worst thing in particular that Solomon or a king could do. So there again, there was, a, there was there a confrontation between the king and God. Later on, in, we hear in Ezekiel's prophecy, a, a great vision of the glory of the Lord leaving the temple. The people were in exile. And there's that lovely passage there where in the vision, God says to Ezekiel, You'll come back. You will be my people again. And I will be your God. And we hear then that the glory of the Lord left the temple. And kind of settled on the Mount of Olives. And finally in Zechariah. We hear that that is the place where God's final triumph is going to take place over the nations. And it's not difficult to read some or all of that into the background of what happened on the Mount of Olives when Jesus and the disciples came there. Well now we're moving to the New Testament and uh, Mark and Matthew's account here is almost identical. One of the sheets that you should have picked up as you came in was this one which is headed Jesus and the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and it's a synopsis, it's a comparison of Mark and Matthew, Luke, John, and also Hebrews. And we'll <clears throat> see a bit what it says. The first thing that you'll notice is that Luke's account is shorter than Mark's and Matthew's. Uh, and it's significantly different too. Uh, most uh, pictures that we see of the agony in the garden uh, take, uh, take Luke's account because it has the benefit of having an angel in it. And uh, I'm not being particularly flippant, but of course it's it, just as um, uh, representations of the resurrection tend to be from Matthew's account because it has the soldiers in it. 
it's much more possible to be dramatic if you've got another figure. And here are two examples. Uh, on the opening um, uh, slide, we had uh, one picture by Albrecht Dürer. Here is another um, where, where there is an angel. A little bit difficult to see. And, um, so here's the angel up here. Not a very big angel. Um, this is a window by Christopher Webb, who uh, did our transfiguration window in St. James. Uh, a much bigger angel. Um, but the point is, there's no angel in Mark's account or in Matthew's account. And um, in that sense, the account is much starker. Luke's account too, um, there are significant differences. Um, in Luke's account, there is no prophecy of desertion. Um, and um, there's a much attenuated version of the, Jesus's um, discussion with, with Peter. And that that's all in the context of the Last Supper. But it's from Luke's account too that we hear about Jesus sweating blood which is another familiar aspect of um, this incident. But then look at John. John doesn't record Gethsemane at all directly. We hear about Jesus and the disciples uh, going to a place where there was a garden. And then the next thing that happens over the page is the arrival of Judas. Like many things in John's Gospel, there are huge absences, like the Last Supper, or, or the institution of the Lord's Supper is absent, so Gethsemane is absent, except in these couple of hints I throw from the farewell discourse and from the arrest, which pick up the idea of Jesus asking God to release him from what is to come, and also talking about drinking the cup. And then finally, in Hebrews, showing that Numerous strands in the New Testament knew about Gethsemane and what went on there. Uh, we hear about uh, Jesus offering up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. <coughs> And now we turn to Mark, and we're going to be focusing on Mark's account. And from Mark's perspective, I'm really going to give you a, an extremely abbreviated version of Mark's Gospel. And I've noted those incidents where Jesus and God interact most directly. <coughs> And I've put who the witnesses were to each of these events, and I've put what happened at them in relation to Jesus himself. And it seems to me that if we look at these uh, five events, the first four uh, are particularly relevant. And the first four are all bracketed by the very first sentence in Mark's Gospel, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God, establishing what it is that Mark wants to tell us. And then at the end, the words of the centurion after Jesus had died, truly, this man was the Son of God. Mark clearly wanting to remind us that this is what the Gospel was all about. So the first event was, was Jesus' baptism and temptation. Um, Immediately following, in just five verses in Mark's account, no detail about what the, um, what the temptations were. Uh, and so the baptism was an affirmation of him and his future ministry, preparing him for that. And the temptation was a testing of him, another way of preparing him for what lay ahead. Then in the, in the transfiguration, where Peter, James and John were with Jesus again. In this case, the testing came before. The testing was Peter saying to Jesus, you're the Messiah. And then when Jesus said, yes, and the Messiah must die, Peter said, well, no, you can't suffer like that. 
and Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan. The testing came first, but the affirmation was clearly there in the transfiguration itself, in words very similar to that of the baptism. And so here in the garden, again we have Peter, James and John selected from the other disciples to be specially close to Jesus. And Jesus himself is tested again. The outcome appears to me not to be affirmation in this case, but his obedience. Then death. And the women are there, as we've noted. And we'll talk a little bit about Jesus' cry from the cross in Mark. But that cry representing absolute separation from God in ways that perhaps we can't really understand. And then finally the resurrection. There were no witnesses to the resurrection. But what happened must have been, in, in the words of one scholar, just as the cross represented the ultimate in Jesus' separation from God, the resurrection represented the most intimate kind of restoration of the love that there always was between Father and Son. <clears throat> so the garden itself, this is literally really the last point of no return. Up until this point Jesus has been able to influence events. To a considerable extent those events were under his control, although if you were here for the first of the lectures, you may remember Bishop Andrew suggesting that although Jesus initiated the events of Palm Sunday, things might not have developed in quite the way that he had expected, and that Jesus' leadership was always subject to what happened, what other people did, what perhaps God had in mind. But from this point on, Jesus is in no real control at all. He's taken away from the garden, bound, and within a few short hours he's being nailed to a cross. According to Mark, they were in the garden for three hours, plenty of time to escape. And yet it seems that the last thing on Jesus' mind, whatever else was there, was escaping. It seems clear that Jesus had hoped for this time with those three disciples particularly to be a time that would be shared. He went away to pray and I'm sure that he hoped that while they were awake they would pray with him. But as we've heard, they fell asleep. And finally, this was a chance for Jesus to be with God. A chance that really, given the brutality that was inflicted on him from then on, a chance that he would not have in the same way during his remaining mortal life. Just one or two things that in passing we might uh, look at and just note the way that Jesus addresses God, Abba, Father. I don't want to go into whether that's a kind of childish way of addressing God. I think not. I think it is simply a way that demonstrates intimacy. And again, this is a really strong Christian tradition. Paul writes about it twice in his letters in Romans and in Galatians. And then, it was only last week, wasn't it, when we were talking effectively about the cup of blessing at the Last Supper. The sharing of the contents of that cup. But when Jesus says, remove this cup, he's thinking of a quite different cup. The cup of suffering. The cup that in the Old Testament, in various places, and I've only noted two of them, was effectively a cup of wrath, of God's wrath and anger. And Jesus himself had talked about the cup in these terms. 
Do you remember when James and John came to him and said they'd like to have the best seats in his kingdom? He'd said, can you drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said, oh yes, we can do that. <laughs> well, now when it came to it, they couldn't even stay awake. So when he found them sleeping, this is not quite desertion. They were still there, but only just. The thing that they'd said they wouldn't do, kind of leaving him, they'd already started to do. They were already, already on the path. And I think it's noticeable that when um, Jesus comes back to them, and Mark puts it like this, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Since the naming of the whole 12 of the disciples in Mark's Gospel, consistently Mark has referred to this man as Peter. But here, Jesus goes back to the name that he would have known him as first. That's part of the reason I took my collar off. Jesus addressed him by the name that was the most intimate. And just like in the Transfiguration, when they didn't know what to say, Peter in particular, didn't know what to say because they were both amazed and frightened. Here they didn't know how to respond to Jesus either. <clears throat> It's also worth noticing that there are echoes of the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, of course, which Mark doesn't have in his Gospel in those terms. <clears throat> Versions of it are in Matthew, the most familiar one, and in Luke. But the sense of it, or the sense of part of it at least is here, Abba, Father, our Father. Not what I want, but what you want your will be done. And then pray that you may not come to the time of trial. Is actually virtually the same as lead us not into temptation. In fact, if you remember back to the various series of alternative services in the Church of England, one of them at least had the Lord's Prayer amended to have the words, do not bring us to the time of trial. But people are conservative and they didn't like the idea of temptation being done away with so radically. <clears throat> so we hear that Jesus began to be distressed. I'm deeply grieved, even to death. And the picture there is a 14th century stained glass window from Austria. So we know that Jesus started his prayers, Abba, Father, and we know the general thrust of his Gethsemane prayers, that the hour or the cup might pass away, because that's what Mark tells us. But we're not told precisely why it was that he was so anguished. Nor are we told precisely how he prayed. The one sentence that Mark gives us is not really three hours' worth of prayer. And it's almost impossible to imagine that Jesus repeated the same short sentence hundreds of times. It just isn't. He was intimate with God. He was used to praying. And I suspect that he would have been really good at praying. Why? Why was he so anguished? Many people suggest that he was aware of what was going to happen to him. He talked about his suffering. He talked about how he was going to be mistreated. If he knew that he was going to be crucified, he would have been aware that this was a spectacularly gruesome form of death, of torture. So was it that? Was he still smarting from the way in which his friends his disciples, those who'd been with him 
on and off, but pretty constantly over the last three years, were going to either betray him in the case of Judas or betray him by desertion in the case of the other disciples. Was it that? And that he couldn't even rely on the three closest ones to stay awake. Or did he sense that somehow if he was going to be taken away and whatever his future was uh, to be eliminated, that God's mission, the thing that he'd been working on in his ministry for those three years, that God's kingdom wasn't at hand as he had said it was so many times but that God's kingdom was as far away, if not farther, than when he started. And although he had accepted the name Messiah when Peter had thrust it upon him, was this a false claim? <clears throat> Any one of those, I think, would be sufficient for a person who had put themselves in God's hands so completely to be upset and indeed anguished. We don't know what Jesus prayed. I suspect that it wouldn't have been concern for himself but concern for God's future. That would have worried him most of all. But I don't know. That's why there are question marks. There are lots of question marks in this presentation, you may have noticed. <coughs> While you reflect on those things, I'll show you another picture. This is Andrea Mantegna, mm -hmm. painting in the middle of the 15th century. And uh, to me, it's probably the best representation of Mark's account. Uh, we don't have angels, but we have, some, we have some cherubs up here. And the cherubs are kind of not offering a cup, they're presenting the cross. The disciples are very clearly sleeping. Not, they're sleeping almost the sleep of the dead, aren't they? <laughs> And here in the background, we've got a huge multitude of soldiers coming out <coughs> from Jerusalem. Um, there are some other quite interesting things. There are a lot of rabbits. <laughs> rabbits here, rabbits there, rabbits almost everywhere. Some egrets. Well, rabbits, I mean, we, we, have, we have bunnies on our Easter carts and all that kind of thing, don't we? Uh, I don't know, there are probably experts here who can tell me more about it, but, but I think probably the rabbits and the egrets, or whatever these little birds are, are signs of new life. Uh, whereas this item up here, some bird or other, again, if someone tell me what it is, looks very black. And uh, that may be a representation of um, the tempter, that even here, even with heavenly intervention, the temptation isn't far away. And this palm tree could be a cross. Well, I suggested one or two reason for Jesus being so distressed. But I wonder whether we need to look for the full answer forward to those words that Jesus gave us in Mark's account from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The opening line of Psalm 22. There are various ways in which it's possible to modify this so that it is not so stark. But that seems to me not to do justice to Mark's account. Or indeed, to what I suspect lay behind Jesus near to death, 
just managing to say those few words. And I think probably we should take them at face value. That that, in the moments before he died, was what he felt. And in the agony of his passion on the cross, why would he not have felt that? Why would he not have felt both separation from God, the God who was so dear to him, the God with whom he had been so intimate, the God whom at the last possible time he had been praying to desperately? Why would he not feel separation? Why would he not feel abandoned at that time? Why would he not feel absolute despair and desolation? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried that out. And it's interesting, particularly since I introduced the idea of the centurion, I never quite understood what it was in Jesus' death that the centurion saw in him that made him <coughs> make that declaration of Jesus as the Son of God, until I was looking at a Jewish commentary on this psalm. And the Jewish commentary says most translations into English have the next line as, and on your other sheet you can find this, the Gethsemane Psalms. The last psalm is this psalm, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? Rabbi Magnet, who, who I've heard speak, and who is a great Jewish scholar, says, groaning doesn't give you the half of it. The Jewish word means roaring. And it's a word that is used in the Old Testament of God. And Jesus, in his death agony, roared from the cross. So, this seems to me to be kind of where we have to get to in Mark's account. It's not the same as the other Gospels. You'll know that the other Gospels have different words that Jesus spoke on the cross. Quite different in tone. Quite different. Mark's is probably the earliest. And, and it's understandable that if one were writing an account of Jesus' life, death and resurrection, this would be a really difficult thing to say. From the point of view of the church subsequently, it has always been difficult to reconcile the separation of Jesus, the Son of God, from God, his Father. So I've given you an, an, some, some ideas that you might like to uh, take away or, or, or challenge me about. Uh, but before we move on towards the end now, I'm going to read you what uh, Jürgen Moltmann has written about this idea of separation and abandonment. This is um, from his book, The Crucified God. Uh, I need to warn you that, that he's a scholar, unfortunately, and a scholar who wrote in German, although he was a prisoner of war in this country in the Second World War. Um, but by, like many German theologians, the words don't trip off the tongue. So I'm afraid, um, if, you don't, if you don't like this sort of thing, just ignore it and, and, and um, think of, of what I've said, which in a way is a kind of paraphrase which I can cope with. This is what he writes. Like no one before him in Israel, Jesus had proclaimed the imminence of the kingdom of God and demonstrated amongst the incurable, the rejected and the hated that it was a gracious imminence, not to judge, but to save. The unparalleled claim of Jesus includes the forgiveness of sins here on earth, 
through the exercise of the divine right of grace. <coughs> By identifying himself with God in this way, Jesus was clearly assuming that God identified himself with him, Jesus, and his words. But anyone who lived and preached so close to God, his kingdom and his grace, and associated the decision of faith with his own person, could not regard his being handed over to death on the cross as one accursed, as a mere mishap, a human misunderstanding or a final trial, but was bound to experience it as rejection by the very God whom he had dared to call my Father. When, he, when we look at his non-miraculous and helpless suffering and dying in the context of his preaching and his life, we understand how his misery cried out to heaven. It is the experience of abandonment by God in the knowledge that God is not distant but close, does not judge but shows grace. And this, in full consciousness that God is close at hand, in his grace, to be abandoned and to be delivered up to death as one rejected, is the torment of hell. So it was Jesus' intimacy with God earlier during his ministry that caused first Gethsemane and then the cross to be so desperate for him. We don't know what Jesus prayed, but we have some idea of how he might have prayed. That's why I've given you these psalms. I've called them Gethsemane psalms, but that's just so that the sheet has a title. There are some psalms that I've selected. The first one, Psalm 116, we're going to use a little later on in a way that I'll describe. But um, the others, Psalm 22 I've already mentioned. But the others, Psalm 42 to 43, which was probably originally one psalm, and Psalm 55, I'm just going to read a a few verses from these to give a sense of how it might have been that Jesus with his knowledge of the, the Hebrew scriptures might have, might have been praying I think it's unfortunate that Psalm 42 starts with that wonderful verse which is, which is the source of many hymns as a dear longs for flowing streams so my long soul longs for you O God because it goes on my soul thirsts for God for the living God when shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people continually say to me, where is your God? And then the refrain, the refrain that comes three times in these two Psalms. Verse 5, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? <clears throat> Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Verse 9, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? And again, the refrain, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Verse, uh, Psalm 43, vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From those who are deceitful and unjust, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you cast me off? And that refrain, again. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you so disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. And Psalm 55 starts, Give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and answer me. I am troubled in my complaint. I am distraught by the noise of the enemy because of the clamour of the wicked, for they bring trouble upon me, and in anger they cherish enmity against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror overwhelms me. And many of these psalms, almost all the psalms of lament, do have within them verses of comfort. And so Psalm 55, passing over verses 12 and 13 and 14, which you might like to look at later and think about whether these are a good description of Jesus' friend Judas. But verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. 
He will never permit the righteous to be moved. What kind of comfort was that to Jesus in Gethsemane? And again, the last sentence of the psalm, but I will trust in you. How hard was it to hold on to that trust at that time? Psalm 22, of course, is often used, will be used in our service on Psalm, uh, on Monday Thursday. And it seems to have informed so many of the individual aspects of the crucifixion itself. But it seems to be relevant to what Jesus was praying in the garden. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. And then verse 19, But you, O Lord, do not be far away, for my help come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. It's all poetic. There was no dog. There was no lion. But you get the sense of it. So you're welcome to take those sheets away. You might like to look at other psalms which have a similar approach. So we don't know precisely what Jesus prayed, apart from that one short summary. And do we know how God responded? Many scholars are quite certain. Here's Tom Wright from Mark for Everyone. Jesus comes through a time of great struggle, a three times repeated prayer for rescue. Eventually, it seems, he hears from the one he calls Abba Father the answer, no. We don't know that. All we know is that after the final hour of prayer, Jesus said, get up, get up. let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Still in control of the disciples, even of well, nothing else by then. Jesus has reached a point where he is ready for whatever is to come. How he got there is, I think, a mystery. But that's not the only possibility. We do know from what happened afterwards that Jesus didn't say, oh yes, uh, that God didn't say to Jesus, oh yes, let me take away the cup from you, because the cup was drunk by the dregs. But there is one other possibility, and that was that Jesus needed three hours prayer because there was no answer. And I wonder if that's a possibility. I wondered it particularly when I was reading um, an article from Time magazine about Mother Teresa. I suspect that most of you will know that for most of the time when she was undertaking all her wonderful work on the streets of Calcutta, that she was wrestling with a complete absence of God in her own life, in her spiritual life. Her intimacy with God started very early on. In 1947, this is what she reported to her Archbishop, a kind of conversation that she had. She reported this, Jesus said to me, Will thou refuse to do this for me? You have become my spouse for my love. You have come to India for me. The thirst you had for souls brought you so far. Are you afraid to take one more step for your spouse, for me, for souls? Is your generosity grown cold? Am I a second to you? Teresa responded, Jesus, my own Jesus, I am only thine. I am so stupid. I do not know what to say. But do with me whatever you wish, as you wish, as long as you wish. 
But why can't I be a perfect Loretto nun here? Why can't I be like everybody else? And then even within a few years, once her work had started and she'd been given permission by the authorities to do it, initially on her own, but then with her sisters, this is sometime in the 1950s, writing to her confessor, or writing at the suggestion of her confessor to God. Lord my God, who am I that you should forsake me, the child of your love, and now become as the most hated one, the one, you have thrown away as unwanted, unloved. I call, I cling, I want, there is no one to answer, no one on whom I can cling. No, no one. Alone, where is my faith? Even deep down, right in, there is nothing but emptiness and darkness. My God, how painful is this unknown pain. I have no faith. I dare not utter the words and thoughts that crowd in my heart and make me suffer untold agony. Ten years later or so, She writes to a friend in gratitude for what he has done to me. I have come to love the darkness, for I believe now that it is a part of a very, a very, very, that it is part of a very, very small part of Jesus' darkness and pain on earth. You have taught me to accept it as a spiritual side of your work. And then finally, in the late 1970s, for me, the silence and the emptiness is so great that I look and do not see, listen and do not hear. The tongue moves in prayer but does not speak. And she asks her confessor to pray for me that I will let God have a free hand. So it seems to me that in spite of that initial intimacy, an intimacy of the kind, I think, which Jesus must have had with God, in spite of that initial intimacy, God then seemed to be absent. And yet, Mother Teresa continued with the work, won the Nobel Prize for the work. But how hard was that? And so I wonder whether Jesus sensed something of that absence of God at that time. And perhaps that absence comes particularly to people who have been most intimate with God. And in a way, it's perhaps a reflection of how people who have achieved that relationship don't need to be affirmed all the time. Perhaps that's why we hear nothing about God's response to Jesus. Because God had given Jesus all the affirmation that he thought was needed throughout his ministry and particularly at the baptism and transfiguration. Jesus knew what he had to do and this was still the same part of it. But God would be denying Jesus his humanity if he were to impose the answer on him. I put these forward as suggestions, not as answers, because I don't think that there are clear answers. There are ideas. So finally, praying with Jesus, and that's um, shorthand for praying through and in and with Jesus, with Jesus on our side. Most of our prayers finish in Jesus' name or for Jesus' sake. It's what we're told to do. But what is it that through the experience that we've had of addressing Jesus' experience in the garden, we might learn? What might we learn about suffering and grief? Again, I don't think there are clear answers, but there might be something in the area of the fact that God has given us free will. God has given us our faith such as it is so that we can be 
persons who can take decisions. He could have peopled the world with robots, and he wouldn't have had half as much trouble with them. But he wouldn't have had half as much joy either. The thing about suffering is, and, su and praying with Jesus, that he knows what suffering is like. He knows what grief is about. He knows what it is to be let down. He knows what it is to see others suffer. He knows about restoring people. And that, I think, is perhaps what our prayer should be, that through our suffering and grief, we have the strength to carry on, perhaps not even for the sake of ourselves, but for the sake of others. And what is it when God says no? God is really clever. God knows more than we do. If we get a really strong suggestion that no is the answer, we need to take that really seriously. The trouble is, a bit like Peter, isn't it? We think we know best. We think we're going to survive everything. We don't want to be told no. And even less do we want God to seem absent. And notice that I've not said in any place that God is absent, but that God seems to be absent. It is impossible for God to be absent. But there may be times when he is relying on us to do what we believe to be the right thing. I think there's something really important about supporting one another and supporting one another as Christians not simply as family members or as good friends in that sense but because we are followers of Jesus Christ and to be honest I don't think we in our churches are quite as good as we might be I don't think we take the need to support others quite as strongly as we probably ought to do. There must be times, mustn't there, when each of us lets other people down in ways we may not even intend to, but, but we let people down. And finally, what are our points of no return? What are those decisions where we really need God's help? Where we just have to keep asking for it. So just a couple of final thoughts with a rather brutal picture. This is no one's idea, I think, of an angel. This perhaps is not a bad idea of Jesus in agony. And so the angel, if that's what it is, or he is, is not taking the cup away. And Jesus is about to be arrested. And I wonder if one way of thinking about <coughs> Gethsemane, as I've kind of already hinted at, is that it is really the crucifixion without the cross. The physical pain is yet to come, but the spiritual pain is being felt here and now, by Jesus. And that's why I think that we're standing on holy ground. I'm going to put this picture back up, because you might find that easier to um, relate to than the last one. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do, I meant to ask you to do this before, is not to clap. I don't think it's appropriate. So, I'll just assume we thought at least it was okay. But please don't clap, because what I'd like to do is to take any questions, and Julian has kindly volunteered to be the roving microphone for a really important job. <laughs> um, and so, I'll take some questions, and then we'll, we'll finish off um, with something else.
Jesus. Keep, keep hearing that. More recently, that maybe he, he wasn't such a bad guy. But surely, he was... Um, every good story has to have a good guy and a bad guy. And surely Judas was almost the devil incarnate, wasn't he? The, the, if saying that he, he might have... You know, he was doing it with another thought. This might have happened or that might have happened. It, it just seems like a bit of a... Bit of a cop out, um, and to be fair, that is the traditional view of, Je of Judas. Uh, but one thing to bear in mind is that Judas was selected by Jesus, mm. and I think that must say something about him. He went around with Jesus and the other disciples for three years, and I think that must say something about him. And it's easy to see why, if you were writing a gospel. You would want to have a focus of the kind that you're suggesting. I just wonder, that's all. I think I could make a reasonable case for Judas. I may not have made it this evening, but I could, I think, make a reasonable case that Judas is not as bad as he's painted. Mm -hmm. But but it's it's for each of us to come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Once you start looking closely at any individual psalm, there will be all kinds of things that are uh, relevant and in unexpected places, really. Um, but of course, the idea of the rock was that God was the rock. And therefore, actually, by, by Jesus calling Peter his rock, he was some, saying something very profound about Peter and Peter's future. Just that Peter had to go through all this before he could become what he became. Um, John, in answer to the gentleman at the front's query about Judas, um, the book of the week after Woman's Hour this week is um, a fictionalised uh, dramatisation of Judas and what might have led him up to it, included amongst the other, other things BBC scheduled this week for them. Um, the second thing I was going to say is what a wonderful series we've had. Thank you very much. And in your aims and objectives in preparing Lent lectures, what might you hope that we will go away with for a Lent well spent at Friday lectures? Um, I, I think what we can do is to try and lay before everybody um, some serious biblical exposition. In most of the other weeks, we've also had some, some um, really profound application of these ideas from the Bible to modern day life. I can't say that that's been the case today, but I think I'm dealing with something rather different. Um, I hope that it will both stimulate, but also encourage us uh, in our own faith and wherever we are in that, that it will encourage us to take very seriously this quite short passage, Mark's Gospel, that we've been looking at. Um, I don't know how God might speak to you through what we've done, but I think the aims of doing something and doing it as well as we could, at least up until tonight, have been achieved. John, do you see a difference between betrayal and desertion? Um, I think there's a difference in degree, really. Um, and perhaps if we if we think about 
process of restoration. Mark, of course, doesn't get as far as the um, resurrection appearances to the disciples, but uh, John does. And what seems to be the case is that um, all Jesus felt he needed to do with the other disciples was appear to them. He had a slightly rocky moment with Thomas. But Thomas was persuaded when he was there in the room. Jesus, it was enough for him to say, peace be with you. And I think at that point, the slate was wiped clean. In the case of, um, in the case of Peter, where, where the, the betrayal was up a stage, um, Jesus made it quite hard for Peter. In fact, so hard that Peter got cross with Jesus for asking him three times if Peter loved him. So the forgiveness for that is, is much greater and much harder. And then if we go to what Judas did, betrayal, or as some people would prefer it to be, handing him over to the authorities. But let's call it betrayal. I don't think that, that Jesus would not or could not have forgiven Judas. I think when he talked about it being better for Judas that he hadn't been born, that could easily be taken to be, as I suggested, um, that Judas couldn't live with himself for the events that were going to follow. So in a way, it was Judas who was saying, I couldn't possibly be forgiven, so I'm not going to seek forgiveness. So, so I think there, is, there are differences of degree. And if we think about our own, our own lives, it's quite possible that few of us would, have, would say that we betrayed anybody, in the sense that, you know, in some situations, betrayal is an absolute possibility. But we might say that we've let them down or deserted them. So I think there is a difference. But were you, were you, were you asking something that I haven't answered? Yeah. Let's conclude then by saying together Psalm 116, so it's on the sheets that you have. The reason for choosing this one to say is because um, we were asked a question a couple of weeks ago as to what was the hymn that um, Jesus and the disciples would have said at the end of the supper. And um, I think it's very likely that this would have been one of the three psalms that were said at the end of the supper. So in a way, it's, it's an introduction to Gethsemane, but it's also a good way, I think, of uh, going out from here. And um, since we've got kind of two halves of the room, we'll say it uh, with the odd-numbered verses on this side, and on the even-numbered verses this side. Um, and what I'd li like to suggest that you do, there is always a danger of saying words, particularly words that aren't really familiar, that, that, that there's a kind of desperation to get through them. Please uh, say them slowly. If you, if you take the time, now I'm not talking about anything silly, but just so that we have a chance to, when it's our turn to read, we can understand what we're saying. And when it's our turn to listen, we can understand what is being said to us. So we'll, we'll simply read through the whole psalm until we reach the final acclamation, praise the Lord, which we'll say all together. So we'll start with verse 1. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompass me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me.
Return, my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a lie. What shall I return to the Lord? for all his bounty to me. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving maid. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Amen.